So even so, in many of the debates, there were very narrow majorities for the government. I can recall one late at night with the House baying for my blood because I moved an amendment on the common agricultural policy on oils and fats, a very recondite issue and uh, of no particular interest to most people at all. Uh, but we had a debate and uh, if you know the House of Commons when it's full and people have been in the bars and so on, there was constant interruptions. But we lost that debate by five votes. I don't think we had got nearer than that during the whole of that period. Um, and that means that uh, once the bill had passed, it put the Labour Party in a dilemma. And Harold Wilson tried to resolve that dilemma by committing the party to renegotiating the terms of entry which Ted Heath had obtained, and which were in the Treaty of Accession. Thereafter, in the run-up to the 1974 election, um, we made further, he made further commitments, that's Harold Wilson as uh, leader of the opposition, and promised in the election campaign of uh, February, March 1974, uh, a referendum on the issue, once the terms of entry have been renegotiated. That sounds very good, but in fact, of course, the Labour hierarchy, including Harold Wilson, were wedded to the idea of common market entry and wanted to wind address some issues on which they could claim that they had renegotiated entry on advantageous terms. I think the renegotiations were a farce conducted by Jim Callaghan, who was Foreign Secretary. And uh, I, uh, as a, I, at that time I was a, a, a small junior minister in, in the Department of Trade, working with Peter Shaw, of course, who was an ardent advocate of no entry. And we worked together and I criticised Jim Callaghan um, and he, he was very annoyed and upset over my criticism of, uh, of his position. Harold Wilson had realised there would be a split in the Labour Party unless, and, and in the Labour government, more importantly, unless he compromised so for the first time in, on record, and I think the only time it's ever happened in parliamentary history, he allowed members of the government to take their own decision of principle as to which side they supported. The yes campaign to stay in the common market and the no campaign to say that we should withdraw from the common market. I played a part, as I'm, many others did, um, in the campaign around the country on television and so on. Uh, but the end result was that we lost by a two to one majority throughout the country. Now, that was very sad, but uh, basically the referendum campaign was heavily weighted in favour of the status quo. The status quo was, we are in the common market, let us stay in. And it's much easier for people to support something which doesn't involve any major change than to vote for something which would have involved a major change by withdrawal. Enormous financial and media resources were available to the Yes campaign. They were not available to the No campaign, which went along on, uh, well, uh, with very little financial support at all, but quite a lot of public support and a lot of loyal uh, canvassers in the constituencies. Uh, the Yes and No campaign sent leaflets to every household in the land one for each side, and then the government sent its own leaflet out, which was arguing, saying, we've, we've done very well, we've renegotiated properly, we've got what we wanted, please vote yes. So there were two yes leaflets to one no leaflet. And I think that um, uh, that helped the final result of the campaign. What also helped was that Harold Wilson made a clear statement in his uh, 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 leaflet that went to all households that the danger of economic and monetary union had been defeated by what had happened in the previous year and during the negotiations. This was wishful thinking, if not a deliberate lie, and as someone who admired generally Harold Wilson, I would say it was probably wishful thinking, Subsequent events proved, of course, that economic and monetary union was on the agenda and, of course, it eventually came about. Since that referendum, which was a major uh, issue in British um, parliamentary and, indeed, national history, there have been more EU treaties. 
each involving further loss of sovereignty to Brussels. Each step has been part of a continuous ratchet effect, whereby once power has been ceded to Brussels, it cannot be returned. Majority voting in the Council is not, as the pro-common marketeers would claim, is not sharing sovereignty. It is actually loss of sovereignty. Gestures have been made involving more consultation with national parliaments, which is almost meaningless. Um, and at no stage has there been any attempt in the EU's history, um, unless dictated by national constitutional considerations, to consult or involve the people of the European Union in the major decisions uh, which have been taken on their behalf. The evolution of the EU has been elitist and bureaucratic, not democratic. It has, everything has been top-down, not bottom-up, as you might expect in a democratic uh, group of countries. National elections have not been appropriate for considering EU matters. Um, only specific referendums have been able to do this. And on the three occasions when they were held in Denmark, uh, France and Ireland, the electorates voted no to EU, further EU developments and integration. Two of those decisions were subsequently reversed by further referendums, which suggest one thing, that the EU cannot accept democratic decisions by the people and is forcing them to vote again and again until they vote the right way. That cannot be any, in, under any circumstance be considered democratic. And that is what the position we are faced here with now, with the Treaty of Lisbon, which has not yet been ratified, with a second referendum coming next year in Ireland. I did play a small part in speaking over in Dublin on the eve of the previous Irish referendum on the EU, joining the EU. That was lost, and I'm afraid that unless luck turns our way for once, uh, it may be the next referendum will be lost as well, which would be a very poor prospect because the Treaty of Lisbon is not the end of this process. There is not yet full economic union. There is not yet full ec uh, political integration. But they're ultimately what people are still hoping for, although they keep quiet about it for the time being, is full political integration, which would mean the end of Britain as an independent country. Thank you.